So thanks for staying with us. So was Bola Ahmed Tinubu the presidential candidate of the All Progressive Con Congress, the APC, a drug lord? The story is not new, and, but it continues to surface. Much has been said about this story, but it clearly hasn't been addressed to the satisfaction of the masses. It resurfaces every time Mr. Tinubu makes a move. It is the unsettled ghost of a life and a time of risk and high ambition. It adds to the complicated and unfinished enigmatic life of Tinubu. Now, we've all heard of these allegations at some point, and today we want to discuss what the ideal character of a presidential candidate is with the continuing drug, logs, drug lord saga as an anchor story. So please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp on 0818-038-4663. Tweet at us at WasteShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WasteShow. So, ladies, mm -hmm. before we bring in our guest, mm. Have you seen the video? Did you read the article? I mean, I was going to skip quick thoughts. One, one from each of you. Who wants to go first? It's super scary. Um, the journalism that has been done and research has been found out to think that this person is actually still walking free. And you know, the confidence that people have in him. I'm wondering how far this video has gone and if people are open to believing it because you know it's easy to just see it and just think oh okay it's one of those things and just sweep you under the carpet but this is huge this is big this is somebody who's going, about to be our leader our president i mean i don't think he should be running for that he's certainly running for the office <laughs> so I, li I like that you already uh, made it clear that this is a story resurfacing because i read the article when it was written right mm -hmm. that was i think weeks ago um if not some months and i think it was in July. when i yeah. saw this come back again i thought oh something new has happened and then i went to watch the video and it felt like i was just reading the transcripts again right so um i like that we're having a conversation but at the same time i feel like it's also it's an important convenient distraction at this time um, because elections is what? How many weeks away from here? Yes, about 100 days. And we've not then. really had the important conversations. Not, oh. not that it, it, it's, I don't know, I don't even know if I'm hopeful or hopeful. So I would say not that it's going to make a difference, right? Uh -huh. Those important conversations. But I, I really want us to get to the point where we're having this conversation. But then I have questions for David. Yeah, so we certainly let's do get to have questions. And break so some things down. Yeah, so without mm -hmm. further ado, um, David Ndeni is a writer, investigative journalist and broadcaster whose work has appeared on CNN, The Africa Report, Al Jazeera and The Washington Post. His work as a satirist um, on the other news, Nigeria's answer to The Daily Show has featured in The New Yorker mag magazine and in the Netflix documentary Larry Charles' Dangerous World of Comedy. In 2018, he was nominated by the U.S. State Department for the 2019 Edward Morrow Program for Journalists under the International Visitors Leadership Program. So, thank I you for joining us. I think this profile is not updated, because I know he's had a couple more awards this year and last year. Uh -huh. So, David, we need to update you. <laughs> we need to update. Send us your, your most recent profile. Yeah. But, um, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you thank can you hear us. Awesome. So, I've seen a lot of, I've seen this video several times, I've read the article, I have watched so many different um, interviews that you have given so far, so I guess even for yourself, I'm wondering if you're already burnt out talking about this topic. But for the people who may not have seen it, may not have read it, um, and for the purpose of setting the scene of the conversation, can you give us a quick summary of this work that you've done, this interesting piece that you've put together? So this is a um, deep dive into the background of one of the three presidential front runners because um, I thought it was an important story to tell, being that this is someone who is running on the ticket of the incumbent party. So this is someone that has a real actual chance of winning that office. Um, based on the experiences we've had since 2015, when the accepted knowledge now is that people didn't know what they were voting for and didn't know what they were going to get, I thought now, uh, people should have that excuse taken away from them. People should know what it is that potentially they want to vote for. And since um, the quote-unquote mainstream media isn't going to do its job and tell this, which I consider to be the most important story, then I will take it upon myself to do it. So um, 
it's funny how you said this is not a news story. Um, to you, it's not a news story. You you might have been plugged into the news cycle for for years, for decades, even as a journalist. But I assure you that to the vast majority of people who read the article, which was published in July, or watched the documentary, which was released on Sunday, it was a news story to them. And that's that's the um, that's the asymmetry of information in Nigeria. So. Um, it's it's a bit presumptuous to assume that everybody knows this already or everybody has heard this before so this is just something coming up as a quote-unquote distraction as you put it i completely beg to disagree now um uh short, long story short because as you said um at this point anyone who 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 doesn't who hasn't who isn't familiar with the particulars of this story really just needs to google the documents and just read it for themselves so you don't even you don't even need to read the story that I published or read or watch a documentary, just Google the documents and read them. But just um, for the purpose of brevity, Cliff Notes version. So the central character here is Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who is currently running for president. Back in the 80s and the early 90s, um, he was identified as a bad man, a money launderer, uh, working on behalf of a, a drug ring in Chicago, which was selling um, Southeast Asian white heroin to the American market, specifically to uh, Indiana, which was a, a heroin um, addiction hotspot, and still is, by the way. Um, now, in 1992, when the um, the FBI investigation into the heroin kingpin of Gary, Indiana, identified a fellow known as Lee Andrew Edwards as the spearhead of the operation, the investigation brought in a Nigerian drug dealer called um, Abiodun Agbele, who was the one supplying um, heroin to Leandro Edwards. So Leandro Edwards was the um, heroin retailer who, who ruled the streets, while Abilda Agbele was the wholesaler who was running the supply chain from Nigeria, which he did in, in conjunction with his uncle, uh, Moise Adikboya Konde. And as part of that investigation, it was determined that the proceeds, the funds that were the proceeds of these um, illegal transactions, this illegal business, were, were being um, laundered through the accounts of a person known as Bola Ahmed Tinumbu. Now, um, these accounts, uh, 10 of them in total, uh, some of them were opened uh, using the address, which was the same address of the house used by uh, Abiodun Agbele as his heroin pickup and drop-off point. So essentially, a drug trap house was the address used by Bola Tinumbu to, um, to open some of his accounts. His wife, Oluremi Tinumbu, also opened joint accounts with uh, Moise, Akonde, uh, yeah, Mo, uh, Moise Akonde's wife, uh, Audrey. And um, there was there were several um, financial interactions between them based on Tinubu's own admission, which, um, were, which was contained in a deposition, which was taken down by IRS investigating agent Kevin Moss in 1992. So basically Tinubu um, admitted of his own volition when he was contacted by US authorities investigating the case, that he knew Abiodun Agbele and um, Moise Akonde very well. He had financial interactions with them. He paid their money into his accounts regularly, huge sums of money, by the way, running into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And bear in mind that through all of this, he was an accountant whose stated income, according to the deposition, was $2,400 a month. So that's that comes to $28,800 a year before tax. So someone making $28,800 a year, who, according to his own statement, had no other source of income, was then found with over $1.4 million in the bank. And uh, if you read the court, the, the deposition taken down by the FBI and, and the IRS investigating agents, it was stated very clearly that there is probable cause to believe that these are the proceeds of illegal narcotics trafficking. And as such, um, an order was issued by the courts to freeze the accounts. Now, eventually, some sort of settlement was reached. What exactly the settlement was is not in the public domain till now. Um, some people have been working on getting it out. But what I suspect it was, was some sort of plea deal um, to basically extract information from him in exchange for um, letting him off uh, basically with a forfeiture, which is what happened. So $460,000 of the drug money was forfeited to the U.S. government. And then uh, the balance of roughly $1 million was returned to the people he claimed owned the accounts. So that was one, um, Kafaru Tinubu and his surrogate mother, Habibat 
mortgage, but no money was actually returned to him directly. So I guess that's just like a Cliff Notes version of the story. It's a much longer story than that, to be honest. The, the, the case documents are around 51 pages, which is why I would suggest that anyone who hasn't already read them should really download them and read them because they, they go into far more detail than I do. And it's always better to see things from the horse's mouth instead of sort of hearing a secondhand version. So thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's an awesome summary. Um, and I hear you when you say that, you know, everyone should go and read it. But then I guess the more people that read it, it also is subject to more people's interpretation because we're also not all legal professionals, no matter how straightforward um, we say the English is. Um, I'd like to follow on, on the part of the forfeiture that you talked about. Um, now, 460000 is about a third of the money um, or just an, over a third of the money that he was claimed to have. Now, would you say that these funds, because if they're criminal proceeds, we would expect that the government would hold on to 100% of the money because they're not going to return um, criminal funds, uh, proceeds from criminal activities to you. So what are your thoughts around that? Are you saying that those funds technically were not fully seized because he could prove that they weren't his funds, which then leads to the fact where perhaps when he's talking about his income, that income is truly not his based on his um, proven source of income, which is the salary that you talk about. Well, then again, if you, if you read the story which I published in July, I included an insert from the US Justice Department where its guidance on the issues of, um, of, of settlements and forfeitures was clearly stated. And the statement said, um, in cases where justice will be served, so as to, uh, what was the term that was used? So as to uh, conserve the resources of the United States government and uh, and uh, and defendants, uh, a settlement agreements are encouraged. So it is often the case, in fact, that where there is criminal activity that is established in a case, and there is some sort of settlement that is agreed or a plea deal or something like that, it is often the case that the defendants can be let off with something. But it's also important to point out that um, unlike the narrative that people like Festus Kiamu have been going around saying that a million dollars was released to him. So that means that it's proof that he was innocent after all. Why would they give him back his money if it was drug money? If you actually read the documents, the money that was refunded, he claimed did not belong to him. He claimed that it belonged to his uncle, or adoptive uncle, Kafaru Tinubu, and his surrogate mother, Habibat Mogaji. So according to the documents, those were the people it was returned to. Because there was, he could he could argue there was some sort of, um, I guess, um, probable doubt. I guess he could argue that the money wasn't his, and that's how come it was returned. But all the money which was directly traceable to him, not a penny of it was returned to him. And again, this can be verified from reading the documents. So I again, you know, regardless of whether you're a legal expert or not, English is English. Some things are stated in very plain English. So I, again, I would recommend for everyone to simply read these documents. They are really not that difficult to get through. Okay. Um, reading the documents, I, I don't know how many people will, but like you said, it's important for people to really go back and read because um, getting the information from the right source is quite important. But I want to take it from the title of um, the video that was put out, which is um, drug law to the presidency, right? And after reading the article, I'm thinking, I mean, from your own interpretation as well, um, would you call this man in question, which is Bola Metinubu, a drug lord or an accountant who is extremely good at what he does, but decided to use his skills for the wrong people? Which, which is he right now? Is he a drug lord or a money launderer? Which one? So if a soldier who is like a highly trained sniper in the military decides to uh, start using his skills on behalf of the mafia, do you call him a murderer or do you call him a highly trained officer of the law who has decided to deploy his skills in service to a criminal organization? It's six and a half a dozen. So that's a very interesting way to put it. There's another analogy. I guess the question for me is whether the, the, the title itself if he's deserving of the title. If he's deserving of the title, is he really a drug, drug lord? lord. Yeah. But, well, um, I mean, if you, are, if you are moving millions of dollars, as far back as the 1980s, if you are moving millions of dollars, I think you are, you are entitled to, to the term drug lord. You're not a street operative 
who is selling dime bags of weed on the corner. You're moving millions of dollars through your accounts. You're buying high value real estate. You're running for office. So yes, I think the, the proper characterization is you are a drug lord. You might not be the drug lord, but you are a drug lord. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting perspective. Mary. Mary. Okay, um, David, so seeing as this has been released, is there any regulation from the Nigerian government? Because nobody seems to be saying anything about it. You know, are the, is this getting to the right authorities or what can be done from the Nigerian authorities to either call him to order or cancel his um, participation in the presidency election? So um, the the fact of his indictment in the U.S. on its own um, will not be enough to uh, to get him off the the roster for next year's elections because, um, as they say, the law is an ass. Under Nigerian law, um, you could have basically been an axe murderer, but as long as it happened in another country, um, technically you are fine. So two things: as long as you don't have something which can be um, academically classified as a criminal conviction. In this case, it's an indictment, but because he wasn't convicted, he didn't end up with a jail sentence or something. So technically, it doesn't count as a conviction. So he's guilty of it, of, of, of narcotics trafficking, but because there's no conviction, there's an argument that, well, as far as the law is concerned, he didn't do it. Even though morally speaking, he obviously did it, but as far as Nigerian law is concerned, there was no conviction. And then, even if there was, it didn't take place under Nigerian jurisdiction. So um, it's qualified to run, basically. And by the way, there are several people across leadership positions in Nigeria who have similar issues. Um, the, the, the current governor of Ogun State is an ex-convict. The, um, the current deputy senate president has had legal trouble, too, similar legal trouble. The, um, the current uh, speaker of the House of Representatives, Sonny Bajabia Mila, um, when he was a lawyer in the States, he got disbarred for stealing his clients' money. Uh, he was very lucky not to go to jail for that. Um, the former Delta State Governor, James Ibori, did a prison term for theft in the UK before he ran for governor. So there are all sorts of examples of people who have been able, who have committed criminal um, offenses around the world, but because they didn't take place in Nigeria, they were free to run for election in Nigeria. Now, having said that, um, what I will also mention is that as a direct result of that story, which I published in July, uh, quite a number of people, uh, tech, well, lawyers, independent lawyers, were motivated to start making their own independent findings to try to establish whether there is some sort of grounds for this person to be um, to be removed from the presidential race. And one of those lawyers was was um, like I guess smart enough to to figure out that. Uh, the smart thing to do would be to actually uh, do a, a, a deeper background check into this person. So the background check I did was sort of restricted to just his um, his official career history, where he claimed to have worked at Deloitte and supposedly saved up $1.8 million from a, an entry-level job at Deloitte, supposedly. And then his entry into the, the drug trade and then into politics and whatnot. But this lawyer decided to focus on something that goes a bit further back from that. So the uh, schools that he went to, for example, his primary school, his secondary school, his, uh, his uh, the college he went to in the US, the university he graduated from, uh, this lawyer retained a US law firm to serve attorney subpoenas on all these institutions. And the results that came back were very interesting indeed. Tonight, in fact, you uh, probably in two, three hours time, when my story gets published, you are going to see some exclusive um, details about this issue that you have not seen before. But uh, let me not give my story away on air, but suff you know, suffice to say that um, both the lawyer and myself, uh, you know, because we've, we've, we've collaborated to an extent, we believe that there is a significant, um, if if the courts do the job that they're supposed to do, if, if the courts you know don't do what Nigerian courts sometimes do, and decide to be funny, if the courts aren't mischievous, there's a very good chance that the contents of the responses to those subpoenas could get Tinubu disqualified from the race because he actually committed perjury on his INEC EC9 declaration. So things like his date of birth, there's a huge discrepancy between what he's, he put down on his EC9 
and what his school records from Chicago State University show. There's a two-year difference, completely unexplained. Things like um, the school records he put down on his INEC EC9 form. He didn't put any records down. He left those spaces blank. And for the years, instead of 1970, whatever, he wrote 0000, zero, zero, zero primary and secondary so, school. Meanwhile, on his on his uh, records from Chicago State University, supposedly it says that he went to Government College Lagos. Yeah, you know, so I think I'll just that. here um, and let us take a quick break. And you've given us so much, and I think we, we have enough questions just based on what you've said to take us through the rest of the show. Mm -hmm. But please stay with us, we'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. If you've just tuned in, we are discussing the character of a presidential candidate, the Jug Lord, um, Jug Lord Saga with David Hundeng. So we'll still love to hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818-038-4663 or tweet at us at Waste Show Africa One with the hashtag Waste Show. So, um, David, before we went on the break, right, um, you just gave a rundown as to the factors that today can prove that this candidate is not of the right character. And I believe when you were speaking to perjury, you were speaking to um, Section 137 of the Constitution, right? That's one of the things that's listed um, as a, a characteristic that can disqualify a candidate for the office of the presidency. Now, I'd like to touch on some of the things that you mentioned. Given the precedents in the many politicians that you also spoke about who have criminal pasts, right? Um, the date of birth, which you mentioned, and I believe, I think somewhere in your video, you mentioned that even he might not know his date of birth. And we talked about some of the peculiarities um, of being born in Nigeria and maybe not necessarily knowing your date of birth, right? So all of these factors don't seem so unusual or without precedent in our space. So what is the driving force behind you focusing and shining the spotlight on this candidate because uh in the game of politics i think if you shake every politician loose even outside of nigeria right you're bound to find some skeleton so why the spotlight on bola Tinubu? well how many politicians who run for president of nigeria submit a forged university certificate to INEC, for example to the best of my knowledge that hasn't happened before to the best of my knowledge the highest ranking um, public official that has attempted to do something like that in that certainly in the Fourth Republic was um, Salih Subuhari, who um, it, I think this was 99 or 2000, was disgraced out of office. And he wasn't even a president or a vice president. I think he was, I think, Speaker of the House of Reps or so. And he was thoroughly disgraced out of office. At that level, there are some basic things, there are some basic standards of behavior that should be non negotiable. So, regardless of who the president is, Right. I have a well-known uh, preference for who I'd like to win next year. But even if that candidate doesn't win, I would expect, and I have a right to expect, that whichever candidate ends up becoming president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is a candidate that didn't submit a forged certificate on his INEC EC9 declaration. I, I don't think you understand just how incredible that is, that somebody is running for president of the country, not for a local government chairmanship, not for you know some uh, state house of assembly position somewhere the president and commander in chief of the federal republic of nigeria and is submitting a forged university certificate on his INEC ec9 declaration form that is unacceptable that is absolutely unacceptable okay so i i i honestly have my fingers crossed for the piece you said will be dropping in about two, three hours. Um, good thing yeah. is I have my notification on on your platform already, so I'm looking forward to that. And I'd like to see how that plays out. But I want to take you back um, to what you said in terms of how our, our constitution works or the law works here, whereby if you're not necessarily convicted in Nigeria, it probably doesn't count until it happens here. Um, looking at the controversies around this particular um, man in question, the candidate, um, if we stay away from this um, drug conversation a bit and money laundering and then focus more on maybe what has happened when he was governor of Lagos State and people that has come in and some of the conversations we've had in some certain quarters around um, um, he allegedly having some cuts from the local government, 
some accountancy issue. I think you even touched on that in a case that was, um, the, I think the, the, the court was burnt down or something. Um, issues like that. If we have more focus on those issues that can be glaring and probably proven and closer to home to Nigerians, do you think that will make more impact? And um, because I've also heard some people say, you know what, this was in the 90s. Can we just move on? What is he doing now? But if we look at the atrocities that we can look at clearly and say, yes, we saw this, we smelt it, do you think it will have much more impact than that conversation? Well, the conversation that I was having just now, for example, which was about the fact that this person submitted forgeries on his INEC declaration. These forgeries were, were submitted in June, barely five months ago. So, I mean, I think that is fairly current. So, I, I mean, um, not to minimize any of the things that you mentioned, but if, we, if we're having conversations about financial impropriety and corruption, those are not new things to Nigerians. Those are really not new things to Nigerians. Like it's th those are serious issues, but realistically, those are not a shocker to Nigerians. So if you tell Nigerians that Ola Ahmed Tinubu is a corrupt politician, he stole money from Lagos State, blah blah blah. That's like saying that the sun is hot. Who cares? To be honest, this I think is the issue that needs to be addressed. That there is a baseline of behavior and of character that is expected of anyone who, who is going to be president of Nigeria, a baseline that even your the likes of Buhari have not violated, to the best of my knowledge. I mean, as far as I know, G General Buhari was never involved in drug trafficking. You know, like he might have, there are a lot of things that I would obvi obviously beg to disagree with him on. His record on human rights, for example, is the reason I'm out of the country. There are so many things to disagree with him about, but at the very least, as bad as it is to be a Nigerian, nobody looks at you yet and says that you come from a narco state. Mm. By the time you are holding a green passport in 2023 or in 2024, and you have a president whose name appears on the same legal document with heroin traffickers. Right? I'm not sure how familiar you are with heroin. Heroin is worse than crack. It's pretty much the worst drug there is. And you have the president of your country being credibly linked to global heroin trafficking. I mean, I can't, it's difficult to, to, to overstate just how, how much of a problem that will be even outside Nigeria for anyone holding a Nigerian passport or, or having a Nigerian identity. If things are bad now, I don't want to imagine what it's going to be like then when the world will be able to look at us through the eyes that even Colombia during the days of Pablo Escobar wasn't looked at. And that's what will happen. So I think this absolutely is an issue that needs to be focused on. And that's why I'm not letting it go. I think it's a fair expectation to have. Whether it happened 30 years ago, and I mean, this happened in like, like the 80s. I was born in 1990. But it doesn't matter whether it happened in the 60s because the person that did it wants to be my president. He doesn't want to be the president of 1993. He wants to be the president of 2023. So it's my business. It's everybody's business. And I'm not going to let it go. Okay. So when we talk about the person and the character and i hear you when you say you're not going to let it go but i'd like to go back in time a little bit and touch on something that you also mentioned in your video which was a former presidential um candidate will i say of the annulled election with Abiola. similar um so this is mk abiola right mm -hmm. with similar um would I say drug trafficking? Because it sounds like that's the baseline that we're setting now. We're saying the key problem here is that it's drug trafficking. It's not really that it's crime. That's the problem. Um, and this was someone who we know that is a hero. Uh, so how do we marry this together? That if as a people at that time, we were excited that this person was coming in to bring um, democracy and all of that, um, but who had the same sort of shadow around him, mm -hmm. um, how do we juxtapose that with where we find ourselves today? Well, um, M.K. Abela was a hero because at the time, um, Nigerians didn't have access to information. Um, at the time, there was no private radio station, private TV station. Nigerians had NTA, Voice of Nigeria, Radio Nigeria, and that's it. The, 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 the only other alternative to that that they had in terms of information was the printed press, which was, you know, very often you would have, you know, men from the government bust into newsrooms with guns, pointing guns at journalists and editors. Nigeria didn't have a free press. So Nigerians didn't have information. So maybe that's why MK Abiola was considered a hero, because MK Abiola categorically was not a hero or anything close to it. 
right? If you, if anyone who is actually conversant with actual history and not the sort of romanticized, uh, curated version of it that has emerged ever since June 12, 1993, would know that, for example, this was someone who was constantly involved in financing coups. So that string of coups that Nigeria had through the 70s and the 80s, MK Abela was involved in almost every single one of them. Right. This was a guy that was a cool financier. This, this was this was literally someone who profited from the things that destroyed Nigeria. First of all, he was a profiteer, right? And then, in addition to being a to being involved in every every kind of business under the sun, both legal and illegal, including things like gun running, which, by the way, this is not just me saying it. Even senior military officers have confirmed this previously, which is one of the reasons why he wasn't liked in senior military circles. This was also someone who, if you recall, the um, the so-called ITT project, which, if it had been properly executed at the time, maybe 20 years before Nigerians got onto the information superhighway, Nigerians would have actually been there. He, MQ Abiola is probably the singular reason why most Nigerians statistically didn't get to have some sort of reliable high-speed internet connection until within the last decade. It was statistically from 2010 on that the majority of Nigerians came online. The rest of the world had been online for like 20 years before that. And MP Abiola is probably the sole reason why that took place. So why on earth this guy is considered a hero? It's simply because people lacked information at the time. Information didn't move at the speed it does now. Our parents didn't know anything, to be honest. All they knew was what they were fed by the NTAs and the Voice of Nigeria and, and, and uh, Radio Nigeria, the propaganda mouthpieces of the government. There was no Plus TV Africa then. People couldn't have these kinds of conversations then via Zoom. Things like this simply didn't exist. So what you knew was what those in power wanted you to know. That's how come MK Abiola is considered to be a hero. He categorically was not. So I, I think from what you're saying now, we have, we knew we have a history problem. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have a much more bigger history problem. Because this is not the first time um, someone who we have considered as hero based on the little history that we follow have been discredited in communications and conversations because we now have more information, like you're saying. And you know how it is when they say for you to really move forward, it's also important to look backward, know where you're coming from, and then know where you're going from there. I mean, I was going to ask about journalism, but your question now um, brings it to mind to ask, how do we even begin to correct this history with the number of information, new information that are coming out? Because at first, we're wondering, why scrap it? Let's know the story. Tell us how it is. And our parents had tales. We're saying, bring it, bring it forward. But these tales clearly are not grounded in facts. So how do we begin to cleanse history for us as Nigerians so that we can begin to have an identity, really? I think the first thing is that um, the... The, the Nigerian government, first of all, needs to do away with the idea that um, history is something that, that is an existential threat to it. The Nigerian government's reflexive reaction to information, information in general, not just history, but the reflexive reaction of the Nigerian government to information is fear, reflexively. Anything that, um, that can make information move faster or faster than it did before, the first response is fear. If you recall, when social media first became a thing, maybe a decade and a half ago in Nigeria, the very first response from government, I and mean, this was as far back as the days of, of Yara Dua, Gulag Jonathan, even going back into the Obasanjo years, the very first response, we were hearing noises about, basically it was fear, right? If the government is not in control of something in Nigeria, it's automatically afraid of it. And, you know, under the Buhari regime, we've seen that taken to ridiculous extents, like, you know, them, you know, banning or trying to ban Twitter and them talking about, you know, regulating the Internet and creating a, you know, China style golden shield Internet censorship system, which obviously they cannot afford. But, you know, that's how the Nigerian government reflexively responds to all kinds of information that it is not in control of. So I think the first thing is that the Nigerian government as an institution, which includes the armed forces, the civil service, the legislative, the, the executive, the Nigerian government needs to get over itself, right? The Nigerian government is terribly afraid 
of information. I remember this was, I think, 2018 or 2019. Um, a good friend of mine, Nelly Kalu, she used to be a radio journalist and she was she was hosting a show. And I think it was um it was Biafra Remembrance Day. And she was having a conversation with Jetan Wanze on the radio about the Asaba massacre, which is a significant historical event in Nigeria's history, right? The Asaba massacre was basically, you know, a massacre of civilians that took place under the watch of um, General Mutala Mohammed, you know, toward the end of the Nigerian civil war, when he basically rounded up all the men in Asaba civilians and, you know, brutally executed them for basically no reason simply because they, they belong to a certain tribe, right? Now, I understand that these are not easy conversations to have. These are not nice stories to tell, especially in a place where we mythologize some of these men. So Mutala Muhammad, for example, who, you know, his corpse should have been tried for war crimes and shot into space, but somehow he ended up on our 20 naira notes and his name is on Nigeria's most, uh, is, is on uh, the international airport in, in Lagos. So I understand that for, in an environment where we, we mythologize bad people, um, this can be uncomfortable. But the reaction of the NBC to that conversation, the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission, who they called through to Nigeria Info and told them to take that program off air immediately. And then they got fined and nearly lost her job. And that was the last time anybody ever mentioned Biafra Remembrance Day on the radio anymore. Mm. Now, tell me what exactly was the, the mention of Biafra Remembrance Day going to do? Which crisis was it going to spark? Which problem was it going to cause? It's a historical event. It happened. 99% of the people who, who witnessed it or were alive when it happened aren't even around anymore. So we're fast running out of time. Um, the Nigerian government is terrified of information. Yeah, so we're fast running out of time and we'd like you to do two quick things for us. Um, this is an expose on one of the candidates, but we have lots of other candidates. So can we look forward to um, some more exposes on some other presidential candidates? That's one question. And secondly, we would like you to give us some one snippet from what we can expect from you in two or three hours. So break okay. something for us here on Waze. Okay, so um, the, I guess to, in answer to the first question, what I would say is um, if, if other candidates have um, issues like this, if other candidates have been involved in international um, uh, narcotics trafficking, and if other candidates have submitted false documents and told lies on their INEC EC9 declaration, then yes, absolutely, there will be such exposés. If other candidates don't have these kinds of issues, and I choose to focus on the, can the only candidate that has those issues, then that's not my fault. That's that candidate's fault. That candidate shouldn't have those issues. All right. Can we get a snippet from you? What's coming? Okay. So let me, I'm going to do something I don't usually do, and I'm going to share my screen, right? To give you a sort of uh, sense of what I'm working on right now. Or, you know. Shall, we, shall we just get a headline? Because we're running out of time. We really want okay, to hear so, it. Okay, so the headline of the story is, has Bola Ahmed Tinubu committed perjury? The evidence says yes. Uh -huh. Ah, well, you heard it here okay. first on ways. We're looking so, forward to that one. Thank you so much, David. Um, Elsie, you have a comment. Let's take oh, that yeah, quickly before we wrap um, up. Since, um, good evening, Ways. Um, I think he's, that's Tinubu now. I think he's too desperate. And if what he's being accused of is true, then he's not qualified um, or ripe to contest for the position of a president. Can you just imagine? Your guest made mention of him forging and faking his age. Is that the kind of person that we can be proud of to be a president of our country? The answer is no. If this man is not honest and sincere, then he should drop his presidential ambition and respect himself. Um, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank one. you very, very much. And thank you so much to our guest, David. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. And we look forward to your exclusive dropping in a few hours. So before you thank go, you do ensure that you follow us on Instagram at Waze Show Africa. You can, drop, you can interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social media engagements. Uh, and remember to like, share, comment, invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. So if you missed today's quote, here it is again. Again, the people have a right, an indisputable, unalienable, indefeasible, divine right to that most dreaded and in, um, envied kind of knowledge. I mean, um, of the character and conduct of their rulers. So we'll see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Bye bye.